Thanks for listening to The Adam Carolla Show on Podcast One. Live by Live has all of your favorite music, and you can listen for free. Whether you hit play on one of our hundreds of curated music stations or create your own custom artist radio station, you'll find the music you love on Live by Live. Visit LiveXLive.com or search LiveXLive in the App Store or Google Play and listen for free now. Novelist and Navy SEAL Jack Carr joins us for a really interesting conversation. Man, this guy's seen a lot, knows a lot. News coming as well. First, I'll tell you about LifeLock. Tax season is scary enough. Now the IRS is warning about ghost tax preparers who don't sign as the paid preparer and could be red flagged. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day we put our info at risk on the Internet. In an instant, cyber criminals could uh, harm your finances and your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock detects a wide range of identity threats like your Social Security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information has potentially been compromised, they'll send you an alert. You have access to a dedicated restoration specialist. Right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours, yours with LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year at LifeLock.com. Promo code ADAM. That's LifeLock.com. Promo code ADAM for 25% off. And now, a totally innocuous word that sounds dirty when Mike Dawson says it. Slippery. Ew. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Navy SEAL. I don't want to say former Navy SEAL. You're always a Navy SEAL when you're a Navy SEAL. Uh, uh, the, it's usually the Marines that have a hard time with that. It's the uh, the former Marine thing that uh, that really trips you up sometimes. But uh, former SEAL is fine, I think, with most of us. Jack Carr's his name. The Devil's Hand, a thriller available now on Amazon, everybody. And it's uh, the fourth thriller and the pulse-pounding Terminal List series. Uh, also, he has a podcast, Danger Close with uh, Jack Carr. Good to meet you, Jack. Great to meet you, too. Actually, I was scheduled to come on last year right around the time the pandemic hit. So it was oh, no. uh, like right in mid-April, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, everything shut down, travel banned. And uh, so I'm glad we're doing it now. It's great to hang out with you guys. Well, look, we finally figured out how to do this. Now we're all used to it. <laughs> there it is. Yep. 20 years uh, with the Navy SEALs, team leader, platoon commander, troop commander, um, led teams in the Philippines, Afghanistan. Um, what about the Philippines? What what What's going on with the Navy SEALs in the Philippines? Yes, yeah, so we had a task force that got put together right after September 11th, and we had a uh, we had a relationship already with that with that government and in that area of the world well before uh, September 11th, obviously. But uh, they've been fighting a an insurgency in that southern island chain uh, for over 100 years now, and there were elements of Al Qaeda. Actually, 9/11, the the plan was hatched in the Philippines. A lot of people don't know that. It was approved in Afghanistan, but uh, there was a, uh, the actual plan uh, came, that was in 1994, 95. They started hatching this plan out there. They were going to bomb these, uh, these planes that were headed in the, uh, in the Pacific, taking off from Australia and New Zealand and places like that. And they were all going to explode essentially at the same time, mid-flight. Um, there was a fire in an apartment in Manila and uh, the, the plan got thwarted only because of that fire. But uh, the plan was hatched there, approved in Afghanistan. And then, of course, a lot of the training and the planning took place in Hamburg, Germany, San Diego, California, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, so it's uh, it was international in scope. Well, let's get back to that original plan. That sounds chilling. Let's... Yeah, it's called uh, Bojinka. A uh, uh, plan Bojinka is what it was called. And uh, part of that was the assassination of the Pope uh, in the Philippines, also in January of 1995. Uh, so it was all um, all. Uh, uh, coordinated and, and ready to ready to essentially ready to go. So without that fire in Manila in December, I think of 1994, uh, that probably would have happened. Um, how many planes did they have? Slated. For I the think it's the, so. What they found in that fire is they got a computer and they got the hard drives from that computer. They exploited that intelligence. I'd have to go back and look, but um, but it was several planes uh, mid-flight over the Pacific. Um, so yeah, quite not, not one. I'd say more than more than one and less than ten. So somewhere in there. And it was. But how did the fire then give way to the good guys finding out the information? 
the uh, fire department came and two people in the apartment ran. Um, and I think one was apprehended, one one got away. He was later apprehended in Pakistan uh, with the Department of uh, the, the Department of Security Services. DSS got them in uh, in Pakistan uh, later that year. But uh, yeah, it was a fire. They were either building a bomb or it was an accident. I read both uh, oh. I read both things. But fire department came. These guys looked spooky. They ran, and then they recovered this uh, this device and started looking into it. And then it fell apart from there. Wow. Hmm. Well, you know, we have a Filipino producer on this show. I didn't, so, I didn't know hey, that your homeland was the, also the birthplace of terrorism. Uh, yeah. uh, but what good news if your country didn't have such shoddy wiring codes, yeah. uh, the <laughs> apartment would have never caught on fire and we'd have a bunch of dead Australians. So tip of the yeah. cap <laughs> Thank you. for that. It's possible. It's possible. Wow. So you're deployed there in, in that year or shortly uh, shortly after? A little after. So, yeah, a little after. So right on September 11th, I was in uh, Guam. It was my second deployment. And in Guam, it was about the mid- middle of the night, and people start banging on doors in the barracks up and down the hallway. And we had a TV in the basement, so the whole platoon met down there, and we watched the Twin Towers fall on TV. And, of course, we thought we were going right to Afghanistan the next day. But uh, the U.S. military and uh, political establishment being what it is, it's a gigantic bureaucracy, and it took a little while to get there. Things, uh, off the ground. So we ended up flying to the Middle East probably a, a few weeks later. And we thought, once again, we were going into Afghanistan. But what we did was enforce the UN embargo against uh, Iraq, uh, the oil embargo. So we boarded ships in what was then called the Northern Arabian Gulf. They'd head out of Iraq, take a sharp left-hand turn for Iranian waters, and we'd have to climb on, board them, and turn them around and get them back into international waters uh, before they hit Iran. So oh uh, that's what we did right afterward. Uh, Bouncer. Other guys, uh, that's it. That's what, it. What, a lot of what, guys went right into Afghanistan, though, but I ended up there about a year later. What kind of ships were you boarding? Everything from small dows to the gigantic class three tankers. So at the time I was a enlisted uh, seal, enlisted seal sniper. And so I'm on the bridge of these things. And what they would do is they would str- take barbed wire and take it and string it all over the ship. So if you came in a helicopter and dropped off this fast rope, it would get tangled up in this barbed wire. So you couldn't go in that way. You couldn't and rappel so down. Right. Into Fast rope is like holding on and you just slide down, but similar right. the same thing. Right. Um, and then, uh, so we go in and the, so they'd wait till the worst weather, middle of the night and they'd head out and then they'd take the sharp left hand turn for Iran and we'd have to zoom up on the sides with boats, climb on board. And then they take all the ladders that are on ships. So you can climb up these different levels. They saw those off <laughs> and then all the doors and windows they put, they soldered on, uh, welded on these different sheets of metal so that you had to then take your mm-hmm. exothermic torch and saws, get through that. Get inside, figure out how to turn this thing around, and get it back in about get about fifteen or twenty minutes to do that. <sighs> wow! It's so nice. the nice. the boat. Let me just see if we can uh, paint the picture. It's nighttime. Yep. Terrible weather. Terrible weather, and the boat's yep. moving at a full clip. I mean, they're not yeah, going half speed. Out. They're going as fast yeah. as they can go. And yeah. you're pulling up next to them in what kind of craft? Like a smaller, it's called a rib, a rigid hole inflatable boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, uh, like 33, uh, what is it, 33 feet? But anyway, it's like a small rubber boat and, uh, you can fit it, like, I don't know, eight, 10, 11 guys on there, something like that. And you had a couple of them and you'd zoom up alongside and then you'd throw these ladders up and hook in the middle of the night, pull the hook away and it would unroll this little thing called a caving ladder, which is about that big. And then you'd climb up. <laughs> This thing it banging off the side of the ship, hoping that it's holding up there with this little tiny right. hook on it, and uh, yeah, get over the side and then clear that ship. How how soon would would they know that somebody had boarded the ship? Would they see you coming they or s- no? I don't know if they would see us coming on their radar or not, or if they had some early warning people out there that were were looking with night vision and that sort of thing. Um, they expected it though, so they expected to to be boarded, which is why they would be going so fast in bad weather, take that left and get to Iranian waters as fast as they could. So they expected it. Yeah. Wow. It's a good time. <laughs> yeah. You never. I mean, I. That's one. Yeah, I've interviewed many seals and they've talked about many jobs, but I never really thought about that job. God, that sounds hairy because, <laughs> uh, I mean, everyone's greatest nightmare is to fall into the ocean at night. Not sure. interesting. Right. Yeah. And especially during bad weather, but especially right next to a big From ship. From a great height. Yeah. yeah. And you and gotta I did, throw and I did the... that. I had that experience. Oh, did you? Yeah. I don't think I've ever talked about this before because most people, we talk about Iraq, we talk about Afghanistan, we talk about direct action missions and sniper missions, so no one really ever asks about this. But, uh, yeah, so afterward, after you turn that big ship around, so 
class three tankers are the gigantic like oil tankers that you see off the, the coast of the United States, the ones that come in gigantic cargo ships. Um, so you turn that thing around, it takes a little while and you get it out there in international waters. And then you bring on what's called a prize crew. And these guys are people who actually know how to drive these big ships. The seals, we don't know. We're just knuckle draggers turning this thing around, getting it out of Iranian waters and get it to a place where the prize crew comes on. And these are people from the regular Navy that actually know how to run these things. And then we would, uh, we would turn it over to the, to the side of a, tanker uh the side of the ship's got to be five stories right i mean it's they're like, big they're huge it's big it's huge yeah okay. they're huge sorry sometimes you have to do multiple yeah you have to do multiple uh hooks uh to get up there so it's it's crazy but uh at the end of one of these we get back on our little boats and then we go back to a bigger boat that then takes us to this large amphibious ship that we're working off of so uh in the middle of the night you know the, the seas are still terrible you have to get back from this little rubber boat onto this bigger thing called the mark five kind of like a pt boat that's the best way to describe it and then as i was stepping across to get onto this pt boat thing this mark five hit this wave and whoosh, with all my stuff, I was the radio guy. I had the radio, my my rifle, full, full loadout of gear, everything went right between the two, middle of the night. My platoon chief thought that was the last that he was ever going to see of me. Um, but my the interesting thing is that my one and only thought was, uh, hey, if I have to drop this radio that has crypto in it, meaning uh, if you lose crypto, then everybody in the theater has to change their crypto and all their radios, and they'll know that a SEAL lost crypto. And so I'm like, I can't drop this pack. I have to swim it. So I swam this thing up just because I didn't want people to make fun of me for losing the crypto in the middle of the Northern Arabian Gulf at night. And uh boat turned around, came back, and they got me out of there. But, uh yeah, it was a good time. I love oh I love God. shame as We're a motivator. Jumping. It is a big motivator. Yeah. yeah. I almost chose death over shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish there was more of that. Um, <laughs> The uh, we were we were talking at the top of the show about uh, John Popper who likes uh, from Blues Traveler who likes his guns, mm-hmm. and we're talking about range. And now you're a sniper. You were a sniper. What kind of range did they want you to have as a sniper? And where was the kind of Mason Dixon line of I'm not taking this shot because I'm too far out? What was that distance? Yeah, well, it more depends on the weather conditions, the wind and on those sorts of things, uh, rather than the, the distance. The distance is important, of course, but then you have other factors. So mm-hmm. a distance in perfect weather with no wind or anything like that is different than uh, full value wind uh, uh, coming from an angle uh, that can can uh, throw your round off target. So there's a lot of factors in there, and each one depends on the weapon system that you're using. So for a 50 cal, which we use the bolt action um, Remington 700 and McMillan 50 cal, uh, uh, that was about uh, 1,600 yards was about what you would be comfortable taking a shot at, so uh, a mile, essentially, with that one. Wow, um, yeah. Other I... things like a 300 Win Mag, which was really our workhorse, <clears throat> that was about 1,400, uh, and you felt comfortable out to 1,200. Yeah. Uh, then a 308 or 762, you're comfortable. You get dope out to about 1,200, but you're comfortable to 1,000. So each one of those uh, different weapon systems has a, 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 a different effective range. Wow. What would you – Brian's got a question, but first – when you're looking through the scope a mile out with the bolt action 50 cal, what are you really seeing through the scope? I mean, how much of your target are you just seeing their torso? Or are you seeing their whole body? Like, what, what are you looking at at a mile out with that? That bolt That's action. more like an area weapon. So you have a scope that is uh, more powerful than the one that you have on your other weapon systems, obviously, because you're shooting farther. You can zoom that thing in. But because you zoom in on those things, that means that if you if you bump it uh, at that kind of a distance, then I remember it getting very uh, difficult to find your target again because you've mm-hmm. zoomed in like this. All of a sudden, you bump in and you're over here, and then you have to go back over here rather than having a larger field of view, being able to see what's going on. So if you're off, you still see your target and you just come back on. So there's a lot of a lot of factors at play there. But uh, that one's more what we'd call an area weapon at that range. So you're taking out a, an engine block. You're taking out a, um, a plane, something like that. We use them to take out the um, speakers that were on these diff- on buildings in a in particularly in the campaign to retake Najaf in the summer of 2004. It was a two-week campaign of urban combat the entire time, and that uh, was against uh, the Muqtada al sadr's militia and that called the Jaysh al-Mahdi militia. And they were communicating through this system where they would just talk. So they're speaking Arabic through these speakers, so you can hear it. And they're talking and maneuvering forces via this network. And so we would shoot the speakers with the 50 cal off these, uh, the side of these buildings. So it was, uh, it was very, uh, very effective. You know, in doing that. 
Wow. Brian, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I imagine the Navy SEAL sniper community is fairly small. Did you know Chris Kyle? Did you serve them? Do you know him? Yeah, so we didn't meet. We, I never met him. Uh, wow. We t- He took over from us in Ramadi in 2006, but I'd already moved on to do a, another special program in Baghdad, so we never uh, Podcast or-